Fulbright Scholars is a good poem to look at when we're studying Module A because it really encompasses what uh, we're trying to explore through the comparative study of Ted Hughes and Sylvia Plath's poems. Um, the poem is clever in a number of ways. And what Ted Hughes does is he mimics Sylvia Plath's confessional poetry style as a way to have this direct conversation with the poetry um, of um, Ariel, the poems published in 1965 by Sylvia Plath. He also is uh, addressing the peanut munching crowd. Plath uh, refers to the, uh, the public as, as um, you know, the group who uh, thrive on gossip and scandal and the objectification of women. So Hughes is, a, is addressing them as well. And he uses his poetry to, to really look at things like the fallibility of memory. Um, and this is um, also about perspective. And so he's presenting another perspective. And um, Plath, when she wrote, was writing at the time, right in the, the middle of um, her her experience, whereas Hughes waits 30 odd years um, before he, he um, publishes his work. So it's probably more measured in, in, in one sense uh, because of that. And he's really um, showing, I think, through the poetry that um, they, they had different personalities and um, their versions of truth uh, differ. And, you know, the 1998, um, Plath's, um, sorry, Hughes's context is um, shaped by uh, it being a period of sort of revisionism, of revisionist history and, you know, this revising of things. But certainly from his own personal context, he is personally responding to the criticisms that he has experienced along the way. So in this poem, he, he um, looks at a, pol a uh, photo and that triggers the memory and allows him to explore his uh, ideas on perspective and memory. And <clears throat> you'll notice that there are lots of uncertainties in this poem. So the poem begins with a rhetorical question. Where was it, the strand? And it really um, shows there is an uncertainty to uh, his memory. Um, the photo, of course, is of Sylvia Plath, who was a Fulbright scholar. She won a scholarship to, to study. And, and um, you know, so this photo has obviously her and a number of other scholarship winners um, as they arrive. Uh, and this is really the first sighting, the, the first meeting between uh, Plath and Hughes. So where was it in the Strand? A display of news items and photographs. For some reason, I noticed it. Now, the word it's uh, interesting, I think, because Plath uses it a lot um, um, as meiosis, as understatement. Um, so he's mimicking her style here to show, oh, the photo, it's not really that significant. He's, he's sort of downplaying this meeting. But obviously, when they first met, the story is it was love at first sight, so it was quite significant. He says, a picture of that year's intake of Fulbright scholars just arriving or arrived, or some of them. So there's certain um, uncertainty there. You've got that short sentence. Were you among them? I studied it, not too minutely, wondering which of them I might meet. I remember that thought, not your face. So he, you know, um, he started his memory is not so much um, positioned by his um, memory of her attractive beauty and you know his drawn to her face. It's more, he, it's more the memory that lingers with him than the actual image. And he says, no doubt I scanned particularly the girls. You know, that's a reference to him being you know, a, a much a male sort of character. And maybe I noticed you. Maybe I weighed you up feeling unlikely. So we've got all these qualifying adverbs, the maybes here because he's not, um, he's not presenting an image of a def, you know, definite understanding. It's all uncertain. And this line here, maybe I weighed you up feeling unlikely, presents another image of, of Hughes, not as the predatory um, male figure, but here he's sort of saying, well, maybe I, I weighed you up using that colloquialism. Maybe I checked you out. Maybe I um, compared my self to you and felt unlikely. 
and and I read it as him saying that I you know that Hughes felt he was unworthy of of uh, plus attention. Um, other people read it the other way and say that that um, he was unlikely. You know, um, he he was above her. But I, I like the reading that it, it's his perspective, and and we're getting a different pers- um, uh, impression of him that that he isn't so confident in in that regard. And he says, I noted your long hair, loose waves. So the loose waves here can act as a metaphor to show her unrestrained approach to life. So if her hair was tied back neat, you know, very tight, it would sort of reflect her personality. But here it's saying she's pretty easygoing and and, uh, adventurous. And um, the next line, I noted your uh, your Veronica Lake bang. So Veronica Lake was a, um, a famous Hollywood star, and she was um, she was featured in uh, film noir films, so film black, and then you know, and she was the femme fatale, the dangerous woman, and um, the bang, the Veronica Lake bang, um, is a colloquialism that um, talks about her hairstyle is and go and have a, have a google of her and find an image and look at that wave of hair that comes across and uh, covers her eye um, but she's got beautiful long flowing and blonde hair and um, so here he's comparing um, Sylvia Plath to a dangerous woman a femme fatale you know in the films they were always deceitful um, and never to be trusted. They were amazingly attractive, and um, the detective was normally compelled and you know absolutely charmed by them. But but um, they would fall under her trance basically. But you know um, quite often it led to to a, um, a negative outcome. So Hughes here is is comparing uh, Plath to this. Hollywood movie star, and you know she she enters the room and um, is at the centre of attention. Um, she's an absolute image of beauty, but what lies within is um, that's you know within is quite a uh, different picture. And he says, you know, I, I noted your Veronica like bang, not what it hid. So here he's continuing that metaphor and saying that that her hairstyle. Um, covers the, her inner self, her inner and darker self. Um, you know, so she has that outward appearance of beauty, um, but the fringe hides um, what's in, in uh, behind that. And and, um, and so he's making reference here to uh, the darker side of Sylvia Plath. Should also say too, the the word choice "bang" here um, speaks directly to the shot. I think you know that. There is sort of like that volatile, violent sort of um, explosive sort of um, connotation, and that that's the impact that she really had on him. It was explosive. Okay, and then he says it would appear blonde. So he's saying her hair it appeared blonde, and so um, you know we're getting a bit of a, a, a picture of Plath here, and he's saying that you know. The white in a lot of her poetry, and and certainly um, Hughes is drawing on this. The colour of her hair being white shows that um, you know there's a sense of innocence, but there's a lot of lot more dark things beneath. Okay, and your grin, your exaggerated American grin for the cameras, the judges, the strangers, the frighteners. Okay, so the American grin here, he's starting to tease apart. Um, this idea of the differences between Plath and Hughes. And Plath um, exuberates this US confidence. She's the movie star. She's outspoken. She's the centre of attention. When she enters the room, um, you know, there's a lot of focus. She loves that attention. Whereas Hughes is positioning us to see him as being more aloof and a bit reserved. And, you know, so they're, they're sort of representative of of the the British culture and the American culture and um, so these two worlds collide and um, you know and, and that's um, something that 
that he's he's building here this this image of difference between the two, and that that you know Hughes has been painted as this this uh, monster, but he's saying to the audience and to the readers that maybe that's not the case. Maybe I'm a bit more reserved, um, you know, and I'm not I'm not out there revealing to the world my point of view, and and um, certainly. You know, he sat quietly and didn't respond to the public uproar for 30 plus years. Uh, he didn't want to enter into that debate. And it's interesting, you know, that he, he, he lists all these um, judges and strangers and frighteners, um, which I think is acid in it. Uh, and the frighteners is sort of like a, a, a reference to um, class demons. And certainly that's um, sort of the language that Plath uses occasionally in her um, poetry. <clears throat> okay, then I forgot. Yet I remember the picture, the Fulbright scholars with their luggage. So the luggage here, wherever it is down here, is uh, a metaphor for their, their own baggage that they bring with us. So Plath's psychological, her emotional, her personal baggage. And it seems likely, it seems unlikely, sorry. Could they have come as a team? I was walking sore-footed under hot sun, hot pavements. And here, so the repetition of hot um, and just the imagery that, that comes across here is um, <clears throat> suggesting that um, Hughes is at a point of suffering, that he's... he's um, He's um, walking through the, the pits of Hades, um, and, and so he's, he's um, you know, referencing uh, the suffering that, that Plath um, explores in her poetry, and, and she presents in her poetry all these ideas of her own suffering because of um, her personal circumstances and her gender and, and um, society's expectations on here. Now what Hughes is doing, he's reframing that idea and he's repositioning us to see, well, maybe Hughes has been suffering too. Then we've got this rhetorical question, question. Was it then I bought a peach? That's as I remember. From a stall near Charing Cross Station. The Charing Cross, you know, it's sort of the burning cross, the religious illusion there, you know, this idea of suffering and sacrifice and martyrdom that he's sort of enduring um, and he, he says was it <clears throat> then I bought the pitch it was the first fresh pitch I'd ever tasted and so there are lots of things going on in this line and there are many different ways to interpret it and certainly there is a sexual connotation that it's his first real experience he's young and he's innocent um, and, and, and so um, we, we can see that and that that um, positions us to see him again as being young and um, <clears throat> naive uh, and sort of caught up in the moment and you know you know we sort of get the idea that he's fallen in love and you know it was a wonderful um, experience for him at, at, at that time you can also go and have a look at um, there's a poem written by T.S. Eliot called the um, the love song of um, Prufrock, J. Alfred Prufrock, uh, which was written in 1910 as a modernist poem. And there are a whole lot of things in there, um, but certainly one of the things that Prufrock says in his poem, he's the character, the persona, says, do I dare eat the peach? And so, you know, the speaker of the poem, Prufrock, is really insecure. Um, he's uh, yeah, unable to act because of his insecurities and and so uh, this is speaking directly to um, how Hughes feels and Hughes actually he had a go he he um, he, he did um, take the pitch where proof rock didn't he he um, is really saying that he tried um, and he, he exposed himself in the sense of he he um, he he had a go basically he he fell in love and he he, he pursued it whereas Prufrock wasn't able to do that. And the other things that occur in the Prufrock poem is that there's, um, 
there's a reference to Lazarus and he says, I am Lazarus, come from the dead, come back to tell you all. And then a line later he says, that's not what I meant at all. So um, he, the, you know, um, the, this textual conversation is going on where I think Hughes is, is um, using the tradition of, um, of T.S. Eliot to say, well, um, you know, that's, you know, what I was trying to say and my, my interpretation and my, my um, perspective has been misinterpreted. And of course, um, this then leads us to Plas poem of Lady Lazarus, where she references Lazarus and says she's going to rise, rise again and eat men like air. And uh, so um, there's there's a whole lot of things going on um, in this poem that we can draw on. Another thing in the love song of um, J. Alfred Prufrock. There's a line that says there will be a time for a hundred visions and revisions. So saying, well, I think you know we can look at that and say, well, this poem, Fulbright Scholars, is another uh, uh, revision of uh, uh, an event, a personality, a perspective, um, and there'll be more opportunities for revision. And and really, he's casting um, you know doubt on on plus original interpretation and also on the, the public's reading of it uh, and saying that there will continue to be um, speculation and interpretation of, of, of what goes on. So once Hughes um, publishes these poems, they become the, the public and they then continue that, that discourse. So there's this ongoing conversation between the poems and the poetry and... and, and um, and, and and beyond there too. So it's it's really um, quite interesting in that regard. Okay, <clears throat> back to the poem. He says, I could hardly believe how delicious. Um, so, you know, this short end stop line here saying that, you know, this, he really embraced it. You know, he was in love. And then the couplet at the end, at 25 I was dumbfounded afresh by my ignorance of the simplest things. So I think we, if we hope, hone in on this word dumbfounded, we are seeing a different perspective. He is caught off guard. He thought he was in this wonderful romance, but, um, you know, and, and, and um, so his, Hughes is revealing a, a different side of his perspective as a young man is that, more here, he's rather than a monster, he's a bit of a victim of the circumstance, and that's reinforced by this word ignorance by my ignorance. Um, so he's really showing that he's innocent and he's naive, and he had no idea what he was getting himself into. Okay, so perhaps this poem alters our perspective of, of Ted Hughes, um, and certainly what it does is it casts doubt on on um, Plath's poetry. It, it, it's challenging us to reconsider that we've been positioned by Plath to, to view her poetry in a particular way. And Hughes is speculating that maybe there is another way we can uh, view that. And I, I, it comes back to that idea that maybe Pats is saying that looks can be deceiving. She seems uh, innocent, an innocent beauty but she's much darker beneath the surface. Um, and, you know, there, there are um, all sorts of things we can read into this poem. We can go back to the peach, the first peach she'd ever had, and we can see that as a religious allusion to Adam and Eve and the, um, <clears throat> the, the, um, the eating of the apple, the forbidden fruit, you know, that, that um, cast them. And led to the fall of mankind, you know, and so the apple represented sin, and so um, you know there, there's this um, sort of um, um, you know revealing of <clears throat> that that once he was led into temptation, it it it, it led to the the spiraling events. Uh, so there are lots of interesting things in there that we can look at, and so perhaps. Um, Hughes is less of a villain and, and more of a victim, or somewhere in between. But 
that's that's the beauty of Hughes's poems. He he published these uh, pretty soon, just before he passed away, and and so he's really leaving it up to the public, to the readers, the reading public, to to come to their own conclusion.